Okay, good evening, everybody. My name is Christoph De Lager, and it's really a great pleasure to welcome uh, all of you here for today's Schrödinger lecture. And it's a lucky coincidence that we have that we will have the Christmas reception right after lecture. And of course, you are all invited to uh, come to the easy common room just uh, down on uh, along the corridor and uh, spend some time together at the at the easy Christmas rece reception. So great pleasure that we will have the Schrödinger lecture um, today of Philip Walter, who came all the way from Poltzmann-Gasse number five to Poltzmann-Gasse no, number nine. So your travel today is very good for, uh, you know, for the climate. So kept the CO2 uh, footprint low. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'd like to welcome also Vice Rector Maya, who is uh, here today with us, and, uh, and the Dean Raudubot. Also, uh, Robin Golso, the Dean of Physics, was planning to come, but he, 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 he couldn't in the, in the last minute. I'd also like to welcome Marcus Moore, who is the representative of the Priester Seminar, who uh, actually on, on the building here. Okay, so welcome everybody to today's uh, uh, lecture. With the, with the Schrödinger lecture, we uh, usually invite uh, prominent scientists to give a, a lecture that is of more, a more general interest in physics or, or mathematics. More general interest, perhaps because it's a, uh, about a problem that is important for society or particularly interesting, uh, fascinating sci scientifically. Today, we will learn about a very timely uh, subject, namely about quantum computing. This is, of course, also related with the uh, research that, uh, that led to the Nobel Prize that was just given on, on, on Saturday to uh, Alain Aspe and John Clauser and, of course, our very own uh, Anton Zeilinger. And I'm, I'm sure that uh, you will perhaps also refer to their work in, in, your, uh, in your lecture. I'm very much looking forward uh, to your lecture. Before I introduce uh, Professor Walta, I would like to um, also point out that we will have a uh, trading lecture about climate change in a, a couple of months, namely on March the 8th. Georg Kaser, climatologist and glaciologist from the University of Innsbruck, will come here to the Schrödinger Institute uh, to talk about uh, the climate crisis, uh, similar to what we heard earlier today in the physics colloquium, very important problem. I think if we are not able to solve this problem, then everything else that we do as, as scientists is actually ir irrelevant. This is really a, a huge problem that we face at the moment, and we have to do everything we can in order to um, mitigate mitigate the consequences of, of climate change. But back to uh, today's Schrodinger lecture, which will be given by Professor Philipp Avalta from the Faculty of Physics of the University of uh, Vienna. Philipp started out as a quantum chemist working with uh, Karl-Heinz Schwarz at the Technical University, but then something went wrong, I don't know what, and he became a quantum physicist. He came to the university uh, of Vienna and joined the group of Anton Zeilinger, did a PhD here at the university before going to do a postdoc uh, in the group of Michel Looking at Harvard uh, University. Then he came back to Vienna, uh, rose through the ranks from assistant professor to full professor, I think that was in 2015, and he has been a full professor uh, at this university since he, uh, he uh, got many prizes. He got the start prize of the, uh, of the FWF. He recently got the Wil Wilhelm uh, Bessel uh, Award. He um, also was recently awarded, together with uh, Piotr Kuschel, who is also here, he was awarded a, um, an ERC synergy grant in which they will study the interface between quantum mechanics and uh, general relativity. He's also the speaker of the SFB of an SFB 
Uh, he's the director of a Christian Doppler Laboratory on Photonic Quantum Computing. He is the speaker of a Forschungsplattform. He is the speaker of the uh, quantum group at the University of Vienna. So lots of speaking going on here. <laughs> so you see, he's a very uh, prominent and very accomplished uh, scientist. And today we are going to hear from him how to do quantum computing with uh, photons. And I'm very much looking forward to your lecture. And I'd uh, like to to the podium here. Thanks. Good, then thank you very much. It's a true honor to be here at the Christmas Schrodinger Lecture. Um, I see from the audience, we have all kind of experts here reaching from computer science to informatics to a physicist. So I had the challenge to what should I cover today? So I thought, well, let's make all of them happy or none of them by giving basically an overview about what photonic computers are about, what kind of challenges do we face? What kind of blueprints do we have to build such big machines in the future? And then of course, to jump to the Vienna speciality but at the end, I would like to show you what we do here in Vienna, where the focus is always on finding new twists, showing what else can be done besides just engineering challenges to scale up those things. But speaking of Schrödinger and being at the Schrödinger lecture, I, I love to show this slide, which I actually have taken from, from, from Markus Arndt many years ago, where there's this famous phrase that somebody says, we never experiment with just one electron atom. In thought experiments, we sometimes assume that we do. This invariably entails ridiculous consequences. We are not experimenting with single particles any more than we can raise ich zu Saudio in the zoo. So does someone know who said that? Well, if I already raised this point of Schrödinger lecture, then of course it's, it's obvious that this could be Schrödinger. So in 51, so 52, just nine years before he died, so not that long ago actually, in terms of the modern science, he, he pointed out that he, he doesn't think it will be easy or at all possible to play with single quantum systems and to explore their features and so on. And actually it has changed. So nowadays we do it, labs do it on a regular basis. And this actually led to the so-called second revolution or so-called second quantum revolution after the development of this um, quantum theory on its own, where now different systems reaching from, this is just a selection, but they're way more from ions in a trap, atoms in optical lattices, superconducting circuits, and photons basically provide a platform where you can really play with single quanta. You can play with them, you can you study them and really exploit those for investigating nature or for modern technologies, which is the, the realm of quantum technology and quantum information processing, um, which I will cover in the next slides. So the just, just, just to wrap up a bit, what's the, what are those um, features that we exploit with, with quantum systems? Um, well, the two things, the first one is superposition, where with photons, it's very nice to get those. You take a quantum particle that cannot be split into less than one particle. It comes here, comes to beam split, where you have a 50% chance to transmit light or reflect. And since it cannot be breaking, broken apart, you end up in a superposition where the photon is delocalized, being at this point and that point, simultaneously, or more precisely, both amplitudes, both probabilities coexist. And when you make a measurement, there's a random answer. It can be found here and there. But bottom line, you can prepare easily superpositions, but just a beam splitter where the light is either transmitted or reflected. And we do the same still nowadays to create the superpositions for quantum information encoding by not always beam splitters, but by modern technologies. That's this so-called integrated uh, photonics where you basically take optical fibers and you put them in a piece of chip, fingernail say, so even size even smaller, where you have modes that guide light, the photons will come here and then by getting these kind of modes close together and by tuning them properly by evanescent light field coupling, you can choose the distance so that the photon afterwards has 50% chance to be here and there. So my words now in a movie to save also my voice a bit is, is basically this, that the photon comes, it then Couples here do it uh, to these two modes, and at the end, you can really achieve a very nice 50 50 superposition on the chip. Very handy for machines that process this kind of encoding uh, quantum information. Well, speaking of quantum information, I have to 
uh, basically introduced the word bit and quantum bit. Classical bits we're all familiar with is, for example, charges, uh, one of the other state, or transistors in one of the other states, so zero and one. In the quantum language, you have these quantum bits where you have coexistence, superposition of these different states. We have now both values, loosely speaking, simultaneously available. Well, here you see actually by one shot only or by one view only the boost from quantum computers, because now one quantum bit and carries these two states inside, intrinsically inside. And then now add more qubits, then the scaling of those bits gets exponentially. If you take, for example, three quantum bits, then you have these eight combinatorics of serum ones coexisting as probabilities in these three qubits. And that's actually the quantum boost or the main quantum boost for computers that the values zero and one are coexisting. And therefore, you can process them much more efficiently for particular algorithms by using the superposition principle. Well, you can use path degrees of freedom for photons, but also other ones. You can also take the internal ones, that's polarization, the way how the photon propagates with the, with the, with the vector by defining a zero state, horizontally polarized light, one state, vertically polarized state, the orthogonal. You can easily change them by polarizers, wave plates as shown here. So you take light and you play a wave plate. Very nice system. Photon is a really nice platform to encode these serum ones as you wish in the single photon state. You can also map one to the other. So you can take a polarization qubit and then by polarizing beam splitter where one polarization goes straight, the other one is reflected. You can even map it to path encoding. So it's a very nice system where you can hop around if you degrees of freedom. That's one of the reasons why we like photons, that they're such a nice, um, thankful quantum system for applications. Good. Changing gears. Well, we couldn't do anything without Schrodinger's entanglement, which is actually not popular these days for many reasons, because the lecture, there's a Nobel Prize last week, and also basically this kind of Austrian spirit that we like these quantum features. So as probably most of you know, quantum entanglement means that you have uh, two, part or two or more particle system where the whole system, the information of the whole system is known, but of the individual system, it's not known. So basically supposition of two, two, two dice here, two die, which it could be the six or one, you know, altogether must be the same, but you don't know which one, the supposition state. If you look at one now, you get a random answer, but the random answer in on one state defines immediately, instantaneously, the outcome of the other side here in our system. And that's something which was, um, which acts as a resource also for computers, so how do we get those entangled systems? And there was a breakthrough method developed in, in the late 90s, the 95, which also contributed certainly to the Nobel Prize of Anton Zeilinger, that developed, a, I would say, a nice and feasible way to get entangled photon pairs without the complicated overhead 10, 15, 20 years ago or before, by using cold atoms or atoms in particular arrangements, and then if very little rates of photon pairs being generated. So the, a breakthrough from my eyes of technology was certainly this kind of down conversion crystal where a laser um, basically is, uh, penetrates this so-called nonlinear crystal where by having momentum and phase conservation, sometimes a photon from the laser split into lower energy photons, which are differently polarized. So you get here basically two photons out of one photon. And the nice twist here is one photon is H polarized, the other one is orthogonal polarized. And now comes the magic trick. When you take light from the cross sections, let's say here and there, or if you take this, this picture here on, on the right side, from the green rings, that's horizontally polarized, that's vertically polarized, if you take light from the cross section, then you get two photons, but you don't know where they came from. So you have generated an entangled state where they have HV or VH, okay? As simple as that. Well, it's, it's not that simple. It takes, of course, proper alignment and very kind of um, very precise fingertips to get it done. But end of, the story, end of the line is with such a nonlinear crystal, you can generate such an entangled state in, in a nice way. And this opened up, um, of course, many, many um, developments. And of course, uh, well, 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 well deserved a Nobel Prize for uh, Anton Zeidinger, who if others developed this source and used this then for many nice investigations covering quantum teleportation, quantum swapping, many pioneering work at that time, which all of them relate on such a source that you have in the laboratory existing. Um, and there's, of course, the Nobel Prize already mentioned by our uh, introduction today from Alain Spee, used atoms back in the days, John Glauser, atomic systems, but Anton Zeidinger used this down conversion crystal for the entanglement studies in the laboratory. But back to quantum computing. So now I, I try to go back on the track. So 
um, to, to, to wrap up the story here, my eyes photons are beautiful for another reason, namely they're mobile, they fly around at the speed of light, literally. And therefore, they're also a nice system for other fields, which are not, will not cover today, uh, but you can also cover quantum communication aspects with that, foundations I just mentioned, metrology, the natural system for measuring something with light. You can enhance microscopes by using quantum light. And uh, now for 20, 20 years, it's known you can also use them for computing um, by using um, particular treatments of, of, of these systems. So quantum computer, um, I guess many of you know of that. So let me summarize a bit uh, what a quantum computer in my eyes is about. So as mentioned, you have an input. That's the magic. That's where the supposition of serum wants play a role. And then you process them and you get an output. And the processing here is done by uh, quantum algorithms. The, I think even though there's such a long lasting history about quantum algorithms investigations, in my eyes, they all have something in common. Quantum algorithms only work nicely and they can exploit this kind of interference phenomena because you have so much input, such a big input state of all series and ones, how do you get the right answer? So you need an algorithm that actually finds or is useful, that it knocks down the wrong answers and by interference, it gets you quickly to the right answer. So for me, in a cartoon, a quantum algorithm is just a, a processing of all possible input states. And then by writing it down in a quantum mechanical way that you have interference and different probabilities, you, you apply at the end an algorithm where the wrong ones disappear and with very high probability, the right ones survive. And therefore, algorithms that have already this kind of interference intrinsic inside, like Fourier transformations and so on, work very nicely. We'll come to that in a second. <clears throat> so of course, that's to the quantum computer. Nowadays, we write it down in a modern quantum circuit language. We have the qubits written down as lines. Here's an zero state. You make it a supposition by a Hadamard operation, but you also need something to entangle to, to make qubits connected. So therefore we use these two qubit gates shown as these lines where one and for example, this third qubit are connected by so-called scene um, uh, as a controlled not concrete phase gates, which can introduce this coupling in a certain in a computer language, introduce entanglement in a computer language. So for building a universal computer, what do we need? Actually just single qubit gates and this kind of two qubit gates. And if you put them together, we can in principle build all kinds of operations that are needed for a quantum computer um, um, to introduce. So what kind of algorithms do we have? So the most famous ones are shown here on the right side. The first one introduced by Peter Shore was indeed an algorithm based on Fourier transformation and therefore it works so nicely. So it was shown that this one has an exponential speed up compared to classical algorithms for factorizing numbers into the prime factors. So for example, I give you C and you have to find the A and B uh, of that. And for that, it was very basically that the, the eye opener that these algorithms exist and can be very efficient. Another one was Grover, who was a few years later to show that he can have a search and be much more better or efficient, but not as good as, as Shaw's algorithm, but just for quadratic speed up, you can find an unsorted base or a database um, uh, the thing you're looking for more efficiently by this quadratic speed up. And another big zoo or whatever area is dedicated to quantum simulation, which actually is the, uh, goes back to Feynman, who, who in 82 wrote there's plenty of space at the bottom, mentioning that actually quantum systems have this potential to be used for studying quantum system. Um, in the spirit of simulating quantum system, also shown since Feynman and later on in the modern language by Seth Lloyd 96, that you can use quantum algorithms to sometimes efficiently simulate um, um, uh, quantum systems, which would otherwise be hard to calculate. And you're the experts here, if you talk about full CI configuration or density functional theory, it's amazing what nowadays you can do, but of course you always face an exponential challenge problem that's very hard to, to simulate up to arbitrary accuracy, uh, the energy levels or everything else of such systems. And with quantum system, there's the hope you can simulate those more, uh, more effectively. I make it short here, and I'm happy that nobody's here. The reason I, I, I put no, Noah's picture here, so I, I picked out a few corner stones in quantum algorithms. They're way more. So actually, the right answer would be here. Um, go to this link. There's a zoo of algorithms. There's current development. There are not too many, but there's still something, a constant progress in finding one and proving that's much harder, that they're really better. Than classical ones. Um, and summarizing briefly what, who, 
what, what's out there. We have those based on Grover, the search algorithms, which have this quadratic speed up. But people realized you can apply this to different problems, including, um, of course, the database search, but also like this kind of uh, saturation problem, satisfiability problems, where you have to color graphs and so on. And for some of these instances, they work better. Um, the Fourier transformations work exceptionally well because of their periodic pattern intrinsically of the mathematical system um, for, 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 for example, here, uh, factorizing numbers, which is the, the killer app for the uh, secret agencies of, of Schwarz algorithm, because you could instant, basically instantaneously crack our current existing encryption methods that are based on, on factorizing big numbers uh, by um, this RSA code. Some linear equations, um, recent developments can also be solved more efficiently with this kind of quantum Fourier transformations. Uh, on the other hand, we have um, quantum Monte Carlo algorithms, which have polynomial speed up existing. And then comes a few where it's not clear yet. So if you could talk to computer scientists, I would probably do a sin now by being not precise to telling you which of those have been proven to be better, which of those have to be conjectured, which of those is just active research. Um, and here the last ones are super active field that people believe there's a benefit, but it has to be proven yet if and how much. Um, this covers uh, also quantum eigensolvers. That's particularly for chemists interesting to find energy levels of, of systems and the very big field machine learning or quantum machine learning that also we pursue here in Vienna where it's not clear yet what, what's better. The feeling is there's something better by using quantum systems for um, identifying um, areas or splitting areas or categorizing areas in, in, in data, like um, quantum support vectors, and k nearest neighbors, and even including neural networks, which uh, will be the end of my talk, giving an outlook what we do, what we do here in Vienna. Good, back to the reality. So what's, what's the situation right now with hardware and real computers? In my eyes, it's actually similar to the situation shown here on the cover page of The Economist a few years ago. Namely, it's an open race. You see different hardware systems from superconductors, photons, and ions. It's not clear yet. Okay, for me, honestly, it's totally not clear yet who got to be the winner at the end. There's amazing progress, um, and you can take a look at the progress by nice plots that you find nowadays everywhere where you see the benchmarking qubit numbers. But that's not everything. But let me start first what you see here. So what you see here is nowadays race. So you have number of qubits, and here's the year. Okay, so since the late 80s, let's say 2000, we have the capability to entangle two qubits and to do controlled operations. Since then, the number of qubits on the logarithmic scale goes dramatically up. And that's obviously also something you see in the newspapers. Nowadays, you read last week or two weeks ago, 400 qubits on IBM and, and these amazing numbers out there that you can have. And you see, if, if, as you have here the, the companies from, from the different fields, from Google, there's basically here this, this, this 72 two qubit system. IBM right now with 50 and the jump to 1,000 uh, end, end of next year. There was D-Wave, the first, one of the first companies already in the, the dark red, 2007 with 28 and then 2,928 qubits available at least in the system. But when you say how powerful they are, well, then it's hard to clarify what you mean with that. So for example, if you take entanglement, you would like to entangle all of those then it becomes very difficult for those systems. And the current record is still 24 qubits with ions that have been entangled. If you have bigger systems, then you have an amazing system, no doubt about that. But it's still not the case that all of those can be easily connected, that you can entangle all of those, or all of those work as you wish. So right now, the qubit number is amazing, but it doesn't reflect the full story about what computers can do. Okay, so people therefore very often focus on the labs, research labs here focus on smaller systems, but trying to improve the controllability of the systems. Um, so I forgot to mention my Norbert Schuch at the end. Norbert, thank you for having Norbert Schuch moving. I put, his, uh, put Norbert's face here because it's an active field of research that's, that basically people, um, that, that in, like there's a professorship on quantum algorithms here in Vienna by Norbert Schuch but he would be the right person to ask details about that. I forgot to mention this because you already <laughs> moved in the beginning, but thanks for, for being uh, 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 moving again. <laughs> Good. That was my, my, my introduction to the quantum computer framework itself. Uh, I would like to, to, to show you where we are with photonic systems right now and what's happening here in Vienna. So photons, um, if I would like to build a photonic, sorry, 
I thought not to mention something. Um, here's the present, here's the future. Some companies make a very bold statement about what they think they can achieve in the next couple of years. And there's one point here which really reached the 1 million qubit um, state space in claimed to be 2026, which is based on photons. Okay, so even though you see many systems here based on superconductors or ions, there are a few photonic systems companies, including one very big one, who aims to have 1 million qubits, photonic qubits, in the next couple of years, at least according to the business plans and things that they publish in, in basically to, um, to, to, to show the developments within the companies. Good. Back to what's happening in the lab and back to how these computers look like for photons. At the end, there's not much needed. So what do you need? We need a photon source to produce single photons. We need some integrated optics to let them meet and interfere them on a chip. And we need detectors at the end. That's a quantum computer for photons, at least in the cartoon picture. If you zoom in, well, then there are some challenges that we have to address. And the biggest challenge is to get good single photons. So I think nature fights with all its tricks and all its methods that we don't get single photons easily. So we have photons everywhere from light bulbs, from lasers, but they're the wrong ones. They have properties that are not good enough for quantum computers. We want a single photon, nothing else. And that's a real challenge. So that's the wish list to be identical, each photon one, one with respect to the other one, photon and a noise contribution. That means not two, not three, not, not more photons. And ideally when I push a button. Taking the down conversion source, which was actually good enough for Nobel Prize, <laughs> which was important Nobel Prize, is a beautiful system, but it's hard to scale up for quantum computing applications because the mission here, even though it gives you right away entanglement, is random. So it's a probabilistic source where sometimes the laser gives you a photon. And even moreover, when the photon pair comes, there could be, there's noise intrinsic because sometimes there are two pairs or three pairs coming out. And all this together is not good for the quality of photons for the computer. So the trend nowadays to get good single photons is to take atoms, but atoms are hard to you know, manipulate. You have to trap them, you have to cool them. So what do you do? You make atoms that you like to have. So you make artificial atoms, which are called quantum dots, where you take a small semiconductor system, which behaves like a single atom, that when the laser comes, you excite, atoms fall back and give you a single photon out. Very nice, okay? So you put a cavity around. So now it's deterministic in the way that the photon is always generated. Huh. But there's no free lunch. So now the challenge is how to get the photon out. Here the photon comes out nicely because it propagates in the direction of the laser. You can catch it, huh. but not a good photon. Here you get a good photon, but hard to catch. So what do you do as well? You build now cavities around and other methods to catch it in a way that at the end of the, all those steps, you get a single fiber, a single mode fiber in there. So now the losses of such a system are given basically by technology, how good you can catch the single photon. And therefore people say, well, it's much better to work on this technological problem than to facing this natural problem. You can't make it deterministic. Well, let's see how to scale up. If you would like to build a photon as a computer with many qubits, then each qubit is a photon. Hmm? Then if you take such a source, then you're limited to 10 photons in a standard way, maybe 40 photons if you do it magically. Why? Because each source emits randomly and to have two events randomly happening at the same time is not often the case. Like 1% here, 1% emission probability there, 1% times 1% is 10 to minus four. So it goes down exponentially. If these sources, where you take one source that fires photons all the time, and then you delay the first that it meets the second photon and the third photon with such a uh, so-called demultiplexing technique, you can get easily to 20 photons. And if you do it smart if, with active elements, easily 100 photons, at least according to what theoreticians think about engineering capabilities in the near future. So big jump in the parameter space. And I could say, wait a second, 100 photons here. I see a million photons over there that they promised in the next couple of years. How can it be? I want to show you that this number is sufficient for blueprints to have as big as you want your computer working in the lab. But just in a few slides from now, yeah. It's better to use one source. It's easy. You would have to use several sources, but it's still not easy at the moment to make them the same quality. So as you, there's still like little random fabrication, but in the future we'd like to have several sources 
Synchrony, not, not identical, yeah. basically. Yeah, that's the problem, yeah. Okay, it was an SPDC source. Excuse me? It was an SPDC source. Uh, the spontaneous parametric down conversion, that's this source here from the beginning, this one here. Spontaneous down conversion. That's, that's the way, sorry. Yeah. Okay, but that's a picture about what's existing now. In the future, you would draw many more, but... Good, photons. Now we have to manipulate those. How do we do it? Well, I've shown you before this one little beam splitter where can, light can couple modes, but we can do it much better. We can tune it. So how do we tune it? Well, we take the same system here with light comes together to put a phase shifter there and then another beam splitter, which overall allows a photon to be at the end here controlled, that we can, can decide photon be found this mode or photon be found that mode or in any superposition. We can tune our qubit or one qubit space or the Bloch sphere a direct and sphere, with such a device with very high precision up to 10 to minus eight. So it's really something that people believe that is done in terms of technology to be really in a scalable way with the control of photons. So of course, one is not enough. People would like to have more modes on what we have. So we have actually one here in Vienna coming from MIT. We have a chip with 26 modes. It's just five millimeter long. So it's really as big as my fingernail, where you have many of those um, systems as before, beam splitter, phase shifter done by heating. So you heat up locally to get a little more distance in the mode, it expands. Um, and if those um, systems in there, these little interferometers, um, the 88 of those inside, you have the capability to tune what happens if the photons in there in a, in a nice and controlled manner. So this is called a photonic chip, where we basically process the information of the computer. It's, it doesn't can, can come to any, everything, but a lot of stuff. And then we'll show you in a second how this is working. So what's the last step? Detectors. I think that's something which is uh, almost done in terms of technology. That there's a, a amazing progress in the last couple of years where, uh, of course, you don't want to lose the photon at the end. You fight so much to get it, then you process it, hopefully very small losses. They would be sad to lose at the very last step. So here people use the best detectors, and these are based on superconducting material where efficiencies of 95, 95, 97% can be realized. And typically you take nanowires, uh, so the nanowires where you have many nanowires here shown as a, as a plate, photon comes, it makes a hot spot. It means the resistance is changing. So it's not superconducting anymore. And then you see this change of being superconducting or not superconducting anymore as a signal. And why nanowires? Because it's a thin material that when it heats up, it gets cold again. It's, that's the uh, rapidly cold, cold again. And there's the systems that nowadays you can buy. So we have here this nanowires shown in the picture. Um, that's the real picture with the fiber coming. So fiber in, here the nanowires, and you put them here in a fridge because they're superconducting, so they wanted cold between four Kelvin, sometimes one Kelvin, depending on the system that you were willing to buy. Or EBD, when the photon hits it? Wow. This is the reason why it loses its superconductivity. So in short, you heat up. Okay, not to do that anymore. In more detail, you're going to make a hot spot and the current gets all the critical current in there. And by the second order effect, the current is to basically go around this hot spot, makes a density on the side that's not superconducting there at these spots anymore. And this has changed the material to be not superconducting anymore. It's changing resistance. This gives the signal, ah, something happened. And then after the photon has been absorbed, it gets cold again from the environment and says, I'm ready for the next shot. That's how it goes. So that's a cycle here. Photon comes, signal, and then ready to go for the next one. Good detectors here. Three uh, percent is that already including the packaging factor? Yep. Uh, oh wow! So actually, we have even more. So hand selected. Also, question of money, <laughs> but you get those. Yeah. That's basically in and fiber as a signal as a fiber in signal out. Yeah. The package. Good. Um, how much time do we have? Half an hour, how much? 20 minutes. Excellent. So I hope for half an hour, actually, but okay. Okay. So I have two, two avenues to go, okay? But maybe I can combine those. So the next one is to show you how you build a universal computer based on the things you've just seen. And I, I love to show it because it really goes back to Austrian research. And then I show at the end what else we do with those photonic systems. So for building a universal computer, which basically scales up nicely and can do all the things we would like to do, 
you have a problem for photons. And the problem is when you would like to implement such a circuit, let's say you have single photons, which encode the qubit, you can address them nicely for the one the single photon control is easy. We have seen this before. But the hard part are those things here to make two photons interacting because photons don't interact. So you have to make, you have to find a smart way to get those to, um, to go through a process that they become entangled or that basically you do some other kind of operations between two photons that one photon tells the other one how to change. So therefore this is easy. And this one is the hard part for photonic systems. And this one is, for example, here the so-called controlled not gate, which is shown a truth table that in the first photon is horizontally polarized. It doesn't affect the second one. If it's vertically polarized, you see it flips the target photon to become different. So the control is the same. And this guy is the slave who follows what the first one tells him to do by its state. Um, if you try to build something like this, like this kind of gate, what can you do? So what was done 20 years ago is the first demonstrations. Well, you take two photons, you build a smart interferometer where you say, well, if photons come out here, this part and that part, they have changed as if they would have done this synod operation. This you can do. What's the problem? Well, it's probabilistic, 11% success rate. And you have to measure the photons that they have been there. So you measure, you kill them. So they do the mission, but they're dead. Okay. What else you can do? Well, there are smarter solutions. You make a bigger, interfer bigger interferometer. Photons come in, control target. You take extra photos, so-called ancillas, which altogether interfere that when you measure these two, this output here is not affected and they go through this kind of operation. So you basically have this kind of hero guys that you measure and they be sacrificed to make the others going through this operation. Amazing. Well, it's still not perfect because it's the chance is 25% to measure photons here, which of course is not the best gate. You want to have always it working, not always randomly. Luckily, if you, if you increase the numbers of ancillas, you can drive it to one. Okay, we have, we've done this, many groups, including us, have shown this in the lab, even if these chips, that these kind of circuits work. But if you would like to scale up for universal gates that always work, then you'll be at the pioneering work of these guys, Nilla from Milburn 20 years ago, who have shown this can be done, but you need in the order of 100, 2,000, 10,000 qubits, extra qubits per gate. Well, in principle, scalable, it's not exponentially scalable, but it's still crazy. Remember, it's hard to get single photons. So that's basically gets, this is the catch 22. Well, there's amazing progress since the last 20 years and somebody has been dramatically put down. But at the end, the scheme where you have photons are always sacrificed the slaves that these here make the gates has been turned out to be not the best, the best architecture. The best architecture is actually something based on a total different scheme they use a highly entangled resource state, a cluster state for computing. And if you go in this paradigm of quantum computing, then it'd be way more efficient. So what's this measurement-based cluster state quantum computing, which is, um, has been developed by Rausendorf and Briegel. As you know, Briegel is the Innsbruck professor of quantum theory. Therefore, I like to mention it as an Austrian contribution to scale up quantum computers. Brief jump for the mathematicians, what's quantum computer, what the measurement-based scheme is about. So the paper goes back to 2001, where they've actually, if you read the abstract, that's basically my story here. So they've developed a quantum computing scheme that consists entirely of one qubit measurements. So you just need to measure your entangled state, where each measurement actually changes the neighbored state, and this allows to make a computation, but to read it, let this read together. So that consists entirely of one qubit measurements on a particular class of entangled states, the cluster states. The measurements are used to imprint, on a, to imprint a quantum logic circuit on the state, thereby destroying its entanglement at the same time. So in other words, of course, when you measure it, you can't go back. I did not mention before, in the circuit picture, you can go always back and forth. Not the linear operations, you go one way, go the other way. Here, it's not possible. When you measure, system is dead. But it's fine because you want to just get the result. You don't need to go back. So what are these states, actually? The states are, well, that's how you draw it. It's a qubit, and it's entangled to the neighbors. For the mathematical uh, mathematicians here, what you do is you take the superposition states of qubits, and you apply between each neighbor a so-called entangling operation or an Ising operation that introduces this entangling bond. That's the hard thing to do. But let's assume this is done. Then you have a cluster state. And now in the cartoony picture, I apologize for being very superficial here. 
um, you remove qubits you don't want. So basically you just leave those here with the lines. And the measurement per qubit here effectively perform the computation because the measurement here affects the neighbor, measurement here affects the neighbor. And whoops, you see this line here? This qubit affects the qubits down there. So this, this is similar to an entangling bond. So to make it short, the measurements here allow to implement all kinds of computations on a given cluster state. In the Mokotuni picture, if it's drawn like this, you make measurements here, you effectively make a one qubit and you rotate it stepwise, measurement by measurement. If it's 2D, then you have basic measurements here, effectively do the same as a circuit with these kind of input states, followed by entanglement from this bond and so on. But just, just, just to show that this is really a powerful framework. Back to architecture of computers. Well, how, how does a computer look like? Give me qubits, entangle them, make measurements. There are certain rules how the measurements have to look like. And then each measurement here changes the state here according to which measurement it did. So the measurement basis, okay, rotates this qubit even by this angle here that defines the basis. That's basically the summary. So why do a body with that? Well, let me go back to what we need to do. We want to build a universal big quantum computer. So this is done by building a cluster state, then simply make measurements, that basically build, uh, is the algorithm, and then read out. So the challenge is to get the cluster state. And why is it not good for photons? Well, how would you do it? Well, you take photons and you have to make this entangling bond. And as shown before, you can take photons here, send them in the beam splitter, look at the output port, and then you would select those where they went out here and that give it a bond. But of course, you need extra longer photons here, longer photons there, because you lose two by the measurement. So you have three photons here, three photons there, and then make the measurement here. Then this guy is gone, this guy is gone, you have six, so three and three is six. Two are gone. That means these four are left that give me the cluster. Yoo hoo, it was grown. What's the problem now? Well, it's just 50%. And that's not a good scaling, 50%. The breakthrough came to say, well, if you adapt this kind of beam splitters with some extra beam splitters and four extra photons, then it's successfully 75%. Or I give you two entangled pairs and build it somewhat differently, again, 75% success rate. That means in three or four cases, I grow. This is interesting. Well, graph theory. You want a big cluster state that might be ugly, but connected that you can go through all the qubits till the end. And it was shown that if I give you clusters with five qubits and I succeed 50% of the time in, in connecting them, then on average, according to graph theory, you will always find a bond that goes from the very beginning till the very end where you measure. Maybe not the straight line, maybe you have to go up here and there, but you know where the fusion failed. So when you know which one is the good connection, then you make your measurements according to this line. And you, according to percolation theory, like a percolation is kind of durchsiedern from cafe. Percolation theory, you always find a way to go to the end. 50%, huh? There's the 50%, but you need these five qubits in the beginning. Can you do better? Yes, you can. If you go down to three qubits, the smallest system in your hands, then it was shown that if you achieve even the 75% for the fusion here, there's this graph about how much, how, how much um, success rate you need to basically make a graph. If you have 75% success rate, you just need three qubits in your hands to fuse them by basic optics. I tell you this because for all the architectures out there, ion superconductors, it's very different. These big systems face the challenge in how to make it bigger and bigger from the, from the scaling. If you have five, how to go to the next big system, okay? How to connect those and so on. Photons are the opposite. So these architectures rely on the challenge to get these free photons on demand with high quality. And therefore the blueprint is really, the hardest thing is the first part, give me a good free photon source. I like to raise the challenge. If somebody finds a way to solve the big problem, it's not easy at all. But if you find, if you just have these free photons in your hand, you can make the next steps by basic optics, where you monitor which detector fired to grow it up to arbitrary size. So then you have these fusion gates, then just passive, passive optics, and measurement-based computation. And exactly, that's a picture of the blueprint companies have in mind. The hardest part is this free photon generation. So they're called Krimberger on Tiling Estates from, from historical reasons. And then comes the, the probabilistic fusions, and you know which graphs are working, 
And at the end, you have computers that, that follow that and you make the measurements. And indeed, the biggest one of the biggest quantum computing companies is following this direction. That's PsyQuantum from a former professor from Bristol, Jeremy O'Brien, who's now in, in California. Actually, his number is not right anymore. It's almost a billion what they raised so far for doing exactly that. Yeah, it's, the, it's currently the hardware architecture for photons. Good. Um, well, being a scientist, you can say, well, that's good enough. You still want to look at different things. People like to look at fusion gates, these kind of connecting atoms, actually connecting photons with other means. There's this big field of beautiful science with atoms, so-called cavity quantum electrodynamics, where you have atoms being the mediator that photons can couple to each other. Many groups do it with, with Carl Tech and Max Planck. People work on getting these GHC states right, maybe right away. From a, from a magic quantum dot that spits out free photons in a, in a in beautiful design. People work on that. And we follow direction here, so more on the research aspect to look at the nonlinear properties of graphene to make photons interact as, a, as an interesting route for looking at these kind of uh, photonic operations. So that was actually my chapter of to hopefully entertain you and show you how you build a universal quantum computer for photons. The last minutes that I have from the chair is about twists what actually we like to do in terms of applications and what photons are good for. How much, how much time do you give me? Well, you shouldn't, shouldn't say this to me, okay. Okay, I picked out a few, okay, uh, to, to hopefully show that it's such a beautiful science that engineering is one important aspect, but it's more fun to show what else can be done with photonic qubits. So one thing that, that I think in particular was for me in particular amazing is that quantum computers allow for security. So we always talk about speed ups, but personally, I think it's not the main application. I think the fact that quantum computers allow to protect data, processed data, is way more relevant facing our internet and these cloud services of computing than just the speed up. Okay? But that's my personal opinion, of course, about the importance. So the question if quantum computers can be, sorry, if computers can process encrypted data goes back to the, to the year 78, when I was born. <laughs> Rivest is one of the guys of the RSA code that was now that is used for this public encryption, where one of these pioneers even asked, can we, by any means, build a computer where the data is encrypted, so nobody knows what's happening, and process it? And there was no answer to that. So it took 30 years to find a solution, mainly because giving useful answers of encrypted information is not straightforward. And we're not talking about a classical solution, which is called homomorphic encryption with huge overheads. And we'll jump right to the quantum solution, which is a blind, so-called blind quantum computer, which can be realized. And blind means it's a feature that he doesn't know the input, doesn't know the processing of software, and doesn't know the output. So it gives you all the power, but remains totally ignorant about what you're doing. Actually, an amazing cloud service. No, you could basically hide all your, hide all your data, hide all your whatever uh, secret calculations, this could be done with a quantum computer. So in a nutshell, it combines the aspects of quantum cryptography, where you use the fact that quantum states must be measured to learn something about those. And these measurements change the state. In, 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 and if, you if you take this aspect into quantum computing, you get this blind quantum computer. I said measurement, huh? it rings a bell, measurement-based quantum computing. Of course, it goes hand in hand with this kind of architecture. And it allows to build a quantum server where you can delegate your computation with basically very little resources in your hand. So how this is done is just one slide. And if you have questions, I'm happy to, to talk more in, in, in the later stage. It's exactly the same as the measurement-based scheme if one little change. So now you might remember we started with these qubits which are not entangled in the cluster state picture before. But now we changed the story that each qubit has a certain phase between the different states. So for those who are not familiar with quantum system, it just means you prepare them differently. They're all particular, uh, different from each other. As a client, you prepare those with different phases, and that's it. But you know for each qubit the phase. Let's say 0 plus 1, 0 minus 1, and so on. Eight different settings are sufficient. The center to the computer has the power to entangle them. You know, he's the, ma the amazing device who has percolation theory and the entangles them and gives you all the power there. And I tell the computer, please make measurements because you know the software. And the computer, even though he makes this entangled state, cannot learn what you calculate 
because to understand what happens to the qubits when you make the measurements, you need two parameters. One is the measurement, this delta, yeah, the measurement setting. Okay, this is something the computer knows. He knows the basis. I measured HV basis. I measured sigma X basis or so. But he does not know the pre-existing phase of the qubit. He needs to know all, also this phase, which only you know. And by having this kind of information not at his, her hand of the computer, he doesn't know what's going on. As simple as that. That's, that's the core idea of this um, blind quantum computing. And ten, no, or it was 10 years ago, you could take photons and show that this is really a, a nice, a, a, an amazing application, which is, can be really realistically studied and done with little photonic quantum computers. If you have five more minutes, I would like to show something else. So that's security. And I can talk forever because we still continue this direction in our labs, as I personally think security is a main, a main field uh, for computers. The other thing that, um, that we like to look at is, can we change architectures? Because photons are so, so nice and so flexible that we like to investigate different concepts. And this is something that comes from the theory developments from Chaslav Bruckner, who looked at, um, well, quantum mechanics allows to superimpose everything, including time, causal orders, not only states. And that basically allowed us to look at uh, different software architectures. But step by step. So what's the idea? Well, I hope not after this almost 45 minutes of talking, you believe me, you can superimpose states, zero and one, or electron being at the same time spin up, spin down, or here uh, light being left or right polarized. You can prepare those kind of states. But quantum mechanics allows you by mathematics to superimpose everything. And therefore, um, people, including Chaslav Bruckner, looked at uh, suppositions that are really superimposing causal relations A before B or B before A. This is, of course, interesting in, in many aspects from foundations up to uh, time and general relativity. This will not cover here. But from a pragmatic side, you can see this as superimposing orders of computer gates. First comes this operation, and then this, or vice versa. This is something you can do with photons very nicely. So why is it interesting? Well, if you think about a circuit, then textbook would tell you the speed up comes from superimposing the serum ones here. That's right. But it can also have a boost sometimes when you superimpose the software, this architecture by having U1 and U2 or the other one simultaneously coexisting. And that's sometimes an, a nice twist to have in your hands. So in a, in, a, in a cartoon way, how does the computer look like? Well, you have a one qubit telling, please target go this order through the computer. If I'm state one, as the state zero. If I be state one, then please go the other order through. If it be prepared to position zero plus one, then if the coexistence of both consecutive steps in here. And why would this be interesting for this little case? Well, a one shot only here, you could show that you can distinguish if they commute or anti commute. A task that no classical or no quantum computer could do by asking only once, because you have to look at first this kind of setting and that kind of setting you compare. But one shot only, this is not possible by even a standard quantum computer. That was the nice twist here. And here, this, for this particular example, it was shown that um, one photon going through once could do it. So back, how does this quantum computer look like in a lab? Well, like this, still proof of principle that you have here, this down conversion source looks a little different, but it means two photons come out. One is a trigger, knowing the second photon is there from this down conversion process. And then we arrange a setup where it comes to a beam split. And if it goes this way first, it comes first for U2 operation. And then here, this one is the U1 operation and going out. Or if it goes straight first, first is U1 operation, then going all this way through this U2 and coming out here. At the end, you see the beam splitter. We have to close the paths because at the end, nature is not allowed, or the U are not allowed to know which one happened first because we want to have a quantum interference of both orders here in the system. Therefore, you close at the end if this beam split again. So now comes the mathematics test. So there's no lecture on mathematics challenge for you. So we can test commuting or not commuting. Here's the answer in experiment. So output here means commuting, output there non-commuting. So we had here the settings for these two different operations. We choose, for example, two times Pauli X operations. Does it commute? Two Pauli X. Yes, no? 
Of course, no? You see here, green answer right. If you take no X and Y, blue answer, do not commute. So at least the setup tells you what you learn in textbook 101 in quantum physics. These operations commute or not commute. And that was done with one shot only. Of course, it goes over different difficult situations, the very high success rate. Good. I make it short to show it at the end where I could talk maybe also other things to show about normomorphic computing. But I would like to show the last thing here because it's so often in the press about supremacy of benchmarking classical computers. So what is that? Supremacy means that people would like to perform a proof, an experiment, where the result of the quantum computer goes beyond to what a classical machine can do. As you get to show that there's no fundamental limit why a quantum computer cannot be the classical device. Let me show, let me show experiments with that. This is not in contradiction to the first, to the slide many, uh, half an hour before, if the qubit's there, because for those examples, you don't need really entanglement in your hands. You need something that is complex in processing, but not necessarily have an entangled state that you can manipulate. Um, and why, why photons and, what, and what, what's all this about? So photons actually were one of the first systems to be considered for showing the supremacy because there was a very nice and, and rather feasible method to do so. And I apologize for this mathematics here, but it's, it just got you through and it's, it's basically uh, basic optics, what you see on, on the slides. So the, the, the particular feature of photons is when you have photons that come to a beam splitter, so that's a photon here, photon and a beam splitter, and the beam splitter is given by a so-called beam splitter matrix written down here. Then it goes straight, it's like this. If it's reflected, it gets an eye phase shift, which you might have learned from the optics courses from the, from the surface. But the point is now when they interfere, then both terms, the terms transmitted and reflected, cancel. Because both photons transmitted and both photons reflected, this gives you I, I, I squared minus one, gives you zero and they bunch. It makes sense because photons are bosons. I mean, they have to bunch if they be quantum systems. So they jump in the same mode and go out happily there. There's not, nothing matching about that. Now, be mathematicians, you would say, wait a second, that's a matrix. If you look at the coincidences here, which, dis which disappear, so what do you do? You calculate this term plus that term. And that's the permanent because you write AD plus C, so AD plus CB. And it was then, people realized that the permanent is a very hard piece to calculate. Different third determinant, it's rather straightforward because they're analytical methods. The permanent belongs to a complexity class called sharp P, which means it's like a salesman problem. Even harder than this, it's like to, to ask how many of those solutions do you have? So extremely hard to calculate. And photons do it for free. I mean, send them on a beam splitter and then make the permanent calculation by their nature. And that was the eye opener to say, wait a second, Let's perform a computation, but based on this interference of photons on beam splitters. So now you take many beam splitters, and phase shifters, photons come in, and there's history about developments in back in the days about such networks for different reasons. But in the modern language, they use this to build a network with many beam splitters, and of course, not always balanced situation. It should be like an, an ugly unitary operation, a big one here, based on many beam splitters. And when photons come in, you basically and you look basically what comes out, then you have to do always calculations with the permanent to predict the answer. It was shown that even when you make random shots, so sampling runs, even this is hard to calculate. And it was shown that if you have 70 photons in roughly 200 modes, you have to do many calculations which go beyond the best classical computation, best classical machines. It really reaches quickly the limit. The spirit of that is actually like this. <laughs> Know what this is? SSC, supersonic thrust. Supersonic car, an SSC, supersonic car. Oh, I forgot. It was the first car that broke the sound barrier on ground. It was very simple, it was stupid. Couldn't do anything else. Not turn left, not turn right, not even has brakes. But it was fast, okay? So it could show there's no fundamental limit not to break the sound barrier on ground. This boson sampling, as this computation is called, or the supremacy is the same purpose not the smartest computation. So people try, try still now, until now, to find applications for such, such scenarios, and there are some on, the, on their radar. But in principle, spirit was, let's be fast, okay? It might not be useful computation, but we show there's no fundamental limit why this cannot be done. Okay, and that's the spirit, same as this car 
Um, and you know, 70 photons is not that crazy. Good. In my words, as a cartoon, so I would like to build a device like this and send photons in there to propagate and then to punch and give you an outcome that you can't predict because it's hard to calculate. So as the idea came out from, from, from if I go back, who was the 2010 from Aronson, MIT that time and, and Akipov 2010, all experimental groups jumped on that. It was, had, had, let's be the first one showing this. Well, we had not 70 photons. So we went to the first non-trivial case. There was three or four photons. And indeed, that was then what the, the groups did from um, uh, Italy to, to Oxford to Australia, including ours, to jump on, little, on, on, on smaller systems like this. The three, four photons, and we have seen this little behavior. It, it works correctly. There was the hope that somebody would scale up in the next couple of years to be the first to show supremacy. Ah, we're not the first. The first one was what you might have seen in newspaper 2019, Google um, with this um, 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 supremacy test in the same spirit. It was a random circuit. Uh, we'll not mention the details here, but the same spirit, not the useful computation, but same aspects here for the superconductor systems. And they basically were the first 2019. But photon guys did not give up. So there was China then coming in. It's always China who basically quickly develops amazing technology who showed that one year later, they outperformed this result by the boson sampling story. They adjusted a bit, they used different photons and, and, and details, but the end is the same that you have here. <coughs> Interferometer, if many photons coming in, they interfere in a way that you can't predict and led to a result that was basically so complex that no classic computer can, can calculate. They want, of course, to benchmark themselves with the work from Google before, and look at the complexity at, at the state space, at the, at, the, at the parameter space, then Google achieved this 10 to the power of 16. But now these people say, well, in a few hours, we can calculate those things. 2019, it was thought it needs 100,000 years. But of course, there's always progress in, in classic computers. And people are challenged. Can we find for this particular computation maybe a smart algorithm? But um, if the photons they achieved now 10 to 30, 14 orders of magnitude, 14 orders of magnitude more complex result in terms of state space. And they have more results um, last year, even bigger state space. So right now, supremacy seems to be done, that there were computer computations achieved that really cannot be solved by classical machines in reasonable time. That means like in a million of years, something like this. So this kind of fear is out of people's head that there should be no problem or limitation for computer scaling up. I stop here because I will not bother you with the, with the latest results for our machine learning. I will just um, stop here and jump to the out to the end. Sorry, I was too slow in the beginning. That, uh, that's actually take home message. I think it's a, it's a bright future, not because of just the hype and the engineering aspect, but a bright future that's still not clear yet, but can be done. There's so many aspects, so many possibilities. And I just showed a few with the if the security and, and, and the boson sampling, and the superimposed gates, I did not mention the machine learning tasks that we have now on the radar and, and, and mimicking the, the neural, neural networks in the brain. There's so many things still unclear and the potential is just to open the box for what can be done. There's things still exciting time to run to computing and applications in that field. Thank you. And of course, so and last slide, I want to thank, of course, uh, no, I'm confused about jump um, to the people who stand to actually do the work. I'm just showing off with the feathers of them. I see some people are here. Um, these are the real experts and the, and the heroes that uh, are in the lab and, and making those things happening and really push technology and, and science forward. Now I say thank you for, for being here. <laughs>